Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a good day to all of you, uh, all the friends who are watching this uh, particular uh, webcast. Uh, I am Zaid Raad Al Hussein, uh, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, now almost the outgoing uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I'll be moderating a discussion for the next hour, possibly an hour and a half, with two very distinguished colleagues. Uh, the president, uh, current president of the International Court of uh, Justice, uh, uh, Abdul Qawi uh, Ahmed Youssef, uh, and uh, Hina Jelani, a, a former special representative of the Secretary General, an advocate before the Supreme Court in Pakistan, and a champion, a worldwide recognized champion of the universal human rights agenda. And I welcome both of them uh, to this discussion. Uh, since it is the first time I'm actually moderating a discussion and not moderated by someone else, I see this as a dry run to a future career. I hope they will bear with me as I work through the scene setting and then the uh, discussion to ensue. So uh, a welcome, a warm welcome to both of you. Could I begin, first of all, by uh, commenting on the importance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as we mark in December its 70th anniversary, uh, a document which essentially set the stage for the codification of uh, human rights law in the way that we know it, uh, and an inspiration to uh, millions and upon millions of people around the world still, uh, the most uh, translated document in uh, the history of the world, uh, written in a, with simplicity and, and accessibility that has made it enduring, not just as a legal text, but as a, a, a work of literature in itself. Uh, the scene setting I'd like to pose before you begins with a comment that President Trump made uh, after departing the G7 uh, meeting, where he said the US would not be bound in the final communique to anything or any uh, comment referring uh, to a rules-based system. And all of us, the three of us, uh, are working in that very context. Uh, when we look at uh, everything else that's happening uh, across the globe, um, the attacks on international humanitarian law, on uh, the uh, uh, protected uh, persons, protected installations under international humanitarian law on a regular basis, whether we speak in, about Syria, about Yemen, um, or Afghanistan. Um, when we look at uh, the return of authoritarianism, indeed, we can see uh, oppression making a comeback in many countries, these pressures on civil society organizations, civil society space. Um, and we juxtapose that against machinery, legal machinery, which is working. The ICJ, the docket of the ICJ is often filled with uh, submissions. Uh, we have the mechanisms here in Geneva that deal with human rights, the committees that uh, interpret the various treaties, the human rights uh, treaties uh, centered here in the building that I'm, I'm in at the moment. And then the mechanisms uh, such as the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention uh, constantly being approached by those who uh, are seeking uh, uh, a settlement to the problems relating to individual rights. And ultimately, ultimately, the pressures on the rules-based system, if it were to succeed, the effect would be to reduce the scope for the individual to exercise her or his rights in their country. Ultimately, they're the ones that are going to pay the price for a collapsed system if we see that happening. So the question is this, do we have enough faith in the resilience of what we've created over the last 70 years to believe that we can withstand these sorts of pressures, whether they are from authoritarian leaderships, uh, whether they are from uh, extremists uh, and violent extremists uh, around the world, uh, or whether they are from, indeed, sometimes you feel the academic community is very cynical about the sort of work that we do. And uh, are we resilient enough to withstand these pressures? And if not, what do you think we would need to begin to think about? And perhaps in the second part of the interview, we'll focus more on that. But if I, if I can start with both of you, maybe if I could start with 
uh, President uh, Yusuf first, and then I, I uh, will go to uh, Hina. But Abdul Khawi, please. Uh, thank you, Zaid. Uh, I uh, don't want to comment on uh, a specific uh, political declaration or statement is by uh, government officials or by heads of state. But uh, with respect to the uh, rule-based system and the rule of law at the international level, uh, we have to recognize that uh, it is fragility, uh, it's not something that's new, uh, that uh, a, uh, we don't have and we have never had a uh, rule of law, a solid, I should say, rule of law at the international level. Uh, we have been engaged uh, in building up uh, and in consolidating a rule of law at the international level for the past 50 years. And I think that it all started with the Charter of the United Nations and with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and with the establishment of international courts uh, as the potential kind of judiciary of a rule-based system or uh, other uh, dispute settlement mechanisms. But uh, you can't have a rule of law unless you have uh, courts or dispute settlement mechanisms uh, which can be triggered uh, immediately after the violation of those rules. And you know that uh, international dispute settlement mechanisms are based on consent of states. Uh, we don't have a compulsory jurisdiction as the International Court of Justice. We have what we call optional uh, jurisdiction and therefore states have to make declarations accepting uh, the jurisdiction of the court or they have to accept to come before the court through a compromissory clause uh, in a multilateral or a bilateral convention. So uh, the system is not yet a system which can be compared uh, to the rule of law or the rule-based system that we can have at the domestic level. It has always been a system which was under construction. And of course, when the system is under construction, it is much more fragile than a solid system. And one of the missions of our court has actually been to contribute to this construction in more than uh, one way, particularly to clarify uh, and interpret the rules underlying the system, uh, to develop those rules, uh, to make sure that there is a common understanding of uh, the principles, the rationale, uh, underlying those rules, the values on which those rules are based. So I think it is through this uh, uh, work of clarification, interpretation and development of the law that we have contributed uh, mostly uh, to the uh, uh, building of a rule-based system at the international level. But much uh, remains uh, to be done. And I think that uh, the work has to continue. Uh, we uh, are having now, for the first time uh, in the history of the court, uh, an extremely heavy workload. And for us, actually, this signal is an increased trust uh, in the judicial settlement of disputes, not a lack of confidence. Uh, you know, when I first came here as a student, in the 1970s to study international law in The Hague, uh, the court had only one case before it. For the past nine years since I was elected to the court, the court is uh, bending cases, uh, have constantly been between 15, 17, 19 cases. And although we try our best to deal with all these cases as quickly as possible, they keep building up again. And I think that actually signals 
uh, an interest on the part of states yeah. to try to settle their disputes through judicial uh, means of dispute settlement, something which did not sure. exist before in the past. No, I, I, I completely agree with you, uh, uh, Abdul Khawi, but I'm going to I'm going to stretch you a little bit uh, after first hearing from Hina and I'll come back to the points that you raised. I don't disagree with what you're saying because you're, you're, what you're saying is a matter of fact. But I think in trying to anticipate and here you might be uncomfortable. So as, of course, the president of the ICJ, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, the senior judicial body of the UN, uh, you may not feel comfortable, so you tell me and I'll, I'll, I, I will I'll deal with the, the question myself. But if I can go to, to Hina and say uh, to you, uh, from where you uh, have uh, worked in Pakistan, but globally, uh, do you sense that this resilience is able to cope with the pressures that we're seeing and potentially the pressures to come, you know. Thank you, High Commissioner, and good day to you, Mr. President. I feel extremely honored to be sharing this uh, conversation with both you and the High Commissioner. Um, uh, Mr. High Commissioner, you said in the beginning whether we do have faith in this rule-based system and uh, would that fa faith help us? to be resilient enough to overcome the current challenges. Let me say very categorically that on the, on the, on the side of uh, a human rights defender and a lawyer, I do have faith in this. And my faith is in this system is because I, I know that while we were complying with that system, things were moving well. It is only when we have started deviating that um, that the, the the problems are arising and the and the and the um, field is becoming more and more murky now. Um, this is making it difficult for lawyers, on the one hand, to be able to assert the respect for human rights, the respect for international humanitarian law, in the way that we used to be able to do without any fear that the very norms are going to be challenged or that the very norms, uh, uh, the violation of these norms is going to be justified. If it's not just those who are the perpetrators of policies or actions that, viol that violate the norms, it is also now become very difficult to persuade the arbiters or the courts of justice, uh, especially at the national level, to maintain that respect for the rule-based system. The, the result is that we are unable now to put our faith in the system of acts to justice. So while we do believe that these norms and the rule-based system has always helped us to make our case of violations, before the, 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 the courts of justice previously, uh, without having to, to justify or to, to in any way, um, um, you know, um, defend uh, the rules. Uh, the rules were always there. Now we are in a position where we first have to defend the rules. Yes. I, this rather is... than, yeah, yes, rather no. than use these rules to measure the act or conduct of states. Yes. I mean, this is, I think, the, the point I was trying to drive at. There's this wonderful uh, tale about how Albert Einstein used to uh, take it upon himself when driving with a friend through a countryside to always test his uh, own powers of perception and that of his friend by trying to guess what's on the other side of a hill as they were approaching it and trying to anticipate whether there would be a lake, whether there'd be a ford, a valley, um, whether there would be trees or not. And I think in part what we're looking at now is we see a resurgence of a chauvinistic nationalism that is the very antithesis of what universal norms are, what a multilateral system is, and, and so we have this oddity, which I think, Mr. President, you set out uh, magnificently, that you, 
you have the machinery is working. So the various working groups here in New York, in Geneva are working. Uh, the treaty uh, bodies, the committees that are interpreting the uh, uh, the uh, uh, human rights treaties are operating. Uh, general comments are being issued, uh, concluding observations issued. That is working. But when we look at the threats, I think Hina does seem to have a point that that we are now making the defense for universal rights, which we thought or we thought that this is a this discussion already won, and it was won years ago, and now we're going back to it. But we also see pressure on uh, you know, international refugee law, not just uh, international humanitarian law and international human rights law. And uh, as um, we noticed yesterday, uh, there is a lot of attention on the World Trade Organization and the, the question mark as to whether it can survive pressures on, on it. And there's now a connection being drawn between trade and security. So all of this uh, puts, uh, in my, uh, from my perspective, uh, our system in jeopardy. And I think, Mr. President, you're right in saying that we have labored painstakingly to construct it. It reminds me of my daughter when she was three or four years old. She'd spend hours building a tower that then she'd take great pleasure in kicking down, and that would take a second. Uh, but it would take an hour to build the tower. And if I could use that uh, sort of as a simple parallel to what it is that we're potentially seeing, that the fragility that you speak in the building process is still very much there. And, um, and uh, we uh, need to think differently, I would submit, perhaps, um, as to how it is that we make the case for a world where we combine our efforts, that we have to be team human being, not uh, firsters in a particular chauvinistic, nationalistic context and uh, deciding matters of policy uh, in a way that uh, puts vulnerable people at risk and uh, many vulnerable people out there. Is that, is that an, a, a reading that is misguided on my part? Mr. President, if I come back to you, Anton Kroni. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, just let me say that, of course, uh, we come from uh, different perspectives because uh, the most of your references are to daily occurrences and daily political developments which take place on the world stage. Whereas here at the court, we deal with long-term issues. And therefore, I look at things in a kind of a historical uh, long term from a historical long term perspective. And you know, I mean, we have to take into account the fact that the multilateral system as a functioning system, whether it is in the human rights field, whether it is in the field of peace and security, uh, is something recent in human history. And that's why I said we are in a building process. And therefore, we are not yet done uh, with that building. And with that, uh, with that process of construction, I think there will be always uh, advances as there may be regressions. And we have to do our best to fight the regressions. And we have to try to consolidate the advances. But we should not always feel threatened when there is a slight departure from the system. This is something that is bound to happen. And I think that since the system is new in human history, 100 years ago, when the Hague conventions and conferences on peaceful settlement of disputes were convened here in the Hague and the Peace Palace was actually constructed, states were unwilling to submit themselves to judicial settlement of disputes. The matter was discussed at length and there was absolutely no state participating in that discussion that was willing to have an independent judicial mechanism uh, resolve uh, disputes between it and other states. This is 100 years, it's not really a long time in human history. But of course, in the last 50 to 70 years, since the United Nations system has been put into place, and since the Universal Declaration has, has, uh, was issued by the UN General Assembly 
the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, we have taken gigantic steps uh, as far as human progress and the consolidation of multilateral cooperation is, uh, uh, is concerned. And therefore, we have to safeguard that system because uh, why should we safeguard that system? Because we have seen, first of all, that it is through that system that people who were subject to repression, to oppression, to colonialism, acquired their independence and acquired their freedom. It is through the right of self-determination of people that decolonization has taken place. And it is only, this was only possible through the multilateral system. It would yeah. not have been possible before that system. Okay. Second, we have seen that in the last 50 years, because of the prevailing atmosphere of peace, which has been ensured by this multilateral framework of cooperation, prosperity has actually been experienced by a wider uh, a, a, a part of the world and has been expanding uh, to various regions of the world where poverty uh, uh, reigned in the past. So I believe that we can be proud of the, of the, of the fruits of the system, of the achievements of the system, and we can agree that the system needs to be safeguarded and to be consolidated further not to be undermined. If I, if I can uh, dwell on this point, uh, many years ago when I was a young man back in the 14th century, I had to do my military service and I took a parachuting course. I had to jump five jumps from a plane. And uh, the interesting thing is with every jump, I became more anxious. I was more aware of all the perils that uh, uh, awaited me as I jumped out of the plane. Is it not also the case that as we have achieved so much, and you rightfully point to the construction of this architecture, and that enabled uh, social movements in many countries to find an anchor point and to raise issues with the governments, the duty bearers, and, ra and push the agenda uh, in a progressive manner against uh, uh, no doubt uh, headwinds that would have existed in at every, at every step of the way. Isn't it also the case, therefore, that we have more to lose and therefore we have more to be anxious about because we have achieved a great deal and to see any regression now would be so painful, perhaps even more painful than never having realized it in the first place. Um, would you not agree, Hina, that that is something that has to be also borne in mind? Yes, certainly. I think we have come a long way and we need to, on the first hand, uh, make sure that we um, preserve what we have and maintain that system. But also, I think we have to develop further. I think there have they, this is an evolutionary uh, process. And we do, from time to time, reconsider what we have already got and where we have to then add to what we have in order to ensure that there is sufficient protection in the system for both the individual as well as a recognition of collective rights, like um, uh, the president has very correctly said, that uh, the, mo the most um, um, important and visible uh, part of international uh, law that uh, recognizes collective rights is the right to self-determination. So we have to make sure that all these things are open, they are not written in stone and that we can mold these to the evolving society and the current needs that we have. But I would just like to take up uh, the, the point that um, the president made with regard to the multilateral system, which is a functioning system. I acknowledge that. It is a functioning system. But at the same time, my uh, reading of what is a functioning system goes beyond what the courts, for instance, uh, are doing. You know, this system is dependent very much, not just on the legal side of it, but also on the political side of it. Because once a court has, for instance, given a decision, what kind of mechanisms do we have to ensure that these decisions are enforced 
in a manner in which governments and their conducts can be corrected and any action that has given rise to concern and the courts have adjudicated that uh, will that though that adjudication will be respected and this is where we see what the problem is and my my concern at the moment and a great worry for me is that this commitment to the multilateral system is waning yeah and if and and we don't recognize this and we um, through our skepticism of the multilateral system forget that this is the just this is the minimum that we do need of course these systems are not perfect but at the same time if we didn't have these systems a lot of what has happened in the past and where prevention of violations has occurred has been because of what the contributions of this system has been if we are um, able to improve them of course there is always this um, uh, room for improvement and this commitment towards improvement that the system itself has in its uh, in it but at the same time i think it's very important that these thoughts are kept in mind systems function only when there is the other side that is taken care of as well because access to justice doesn't mean that people can go just to courts and get a good uh, uh, judgment uh, a fair judgment but also that that fair judgment brings them the remedy that they uh, originally uh, expected when they went to court if the remedy does not come that will be a, a difficult thing because you know i have grown up in a in a, a tradition of law where you know from the very beginning as law students we were taught that there, where there is a right there is a remedy yeah. we recognize the rights very well our populations recognize the rights very well and i think that's a very positive development also when the people recognize that they have the right and this is something that the civil society has contributed to a great deal but at the same time the remedy some many times is not available because not because of the uh, failings of the of the judicial system at the international or national levels but because the control over actions of the state become very difficult and uh, the enforcement of judicial decisions especially at the international levels you will see there have been many judgments which have acknowledged rights but at the end of it the the remedy for the victims does not come because these judgments are ignored these uh, these declaration of justice and fairness by courts are ignored so these are some of the things i think that in the current challenges are important for us to to consider well and see where we can um uh, take action at the international level and devise means uh, to overcome the problems that we are facing now where people are going their own way and unilateral unilateralism seems to have become uh, the buzzword right now and we are the ones uh, you know there's this nationalistic thing we are the ones who are going to decide what is good for us uh, the people have become very immune to the notion that uh, the rule of law and rule based systems only um you know prosper when there is a complete recognition of the universality of these rules yeah and also i think it's important uh, for me that um, people who are you know administering justice must know that while they should never be influenced by the political environment they must have a good understanding of it yes. it's not that they can keep aloof from it yes. because justice will be done in the context of the political environment that we face either globally or in our at our in our national uh, uh, um, context yes. so these are the things that i think are important well i think I, you've touched on an important uh, other point and that is that is the multilateral system simply symptomatic and a mere reflection of what we see out there in other words if the if the global condition is a poor one the multilateral system suffers or should we look at it as aspirational that there is law that has to be uh, interpreted that has to be safeguarded 
and then has the, the multilateral system has to provide leadership. In other words, we have to go back to those who constructed this architecture and said, remind them why they did this in the first place. It, it was born out of enormous suffering and violence, and it was the distillation of human experience uh, as codified in law, which brought us to this point. And of course, Mr. President, you mentioned the Hague regulations and, and the, the devastating Franco-Prussian war that uh, preceded it. Short war, but, but very violent war in, in the heart of Europe. Uh, and this is what I think uh, in one way worries at least us in the human rights community that, that memory is being lost and being superseded by sort of nationalistic passions which drive a firster agenda. In other words, we will carve out of the international system what's good for us, but we're not really interested in the common good or the common effort. Uh, for us, it's more important that we win elections, that we uh, have a constituency that we support, uh, and if they're a majority uh, population, then uh, ethnic population, then we will, we will triumph at the expense of uh, those rights of the more vulnerable groups. Ultimately, taking this back to the Universal Declaration, it is still the individual who will pay the price for the folly of humankind. And I'm reminded of a an author who wrote this wonderful lyrical passage about the First World War in which he had direct experience and he referred to the invincibility of man's stupidity. That no, try as we might to construct a, a, an ordered society built on the suffering and the violations uh, attended to others, we will constantly be met by those who will plunge us into the worst recesses and impulses available to humankind. Um, and uh, in this constant struggle, uh, doesn't Hina have a point that we need to be aspirational, that if we're seen as just a mechanism, inert, bureaucratic, uh, dispensing with either judicial uh, decisions or advisory opinions, or in our case, decisions by the treaty bodies, by the working groups, um, uh, which have a quasi uh, sort of judicial quality to them, um, that uh, we will never quite meet the expectations of those who really need us most, those who will suffer the greatest if we fail or who are suffering at the moment because we're not doing better. Well, no, definitely we need to be aspirational. And I think that we need to improve uh, the system and we need to think about uh, how best to improve the system, how best to move it forward also, and uh, uh, to ensure that the prosperity, the well-being that uh, has resulted from peace, uh, from the recognition of human rights, uh, from the colonization, uh, from the recognition of collective rights of people, uh, the right to self-determination, uh, that all these gains are preserved and that they are uh, taken forward because they are gains for humanity as a whole. And therefore, uh, we have to safeguard them, we have to preserve them. But we also need to uh, ask ourselves, as far as the multilateral system is concerned, whether perhaps there has not been a failure uh, to review the system, uh, to uh, a restart the system, to reform the system, uh, to uh, re-equip the system in a way. Uh, to uh, make it, to adapt it uh, to the evolution uh, of the world, uh, to the evolution of humanity, uh, to the manner in which things are done, to the evolution of technology as well, and to the globalization, which perhaps has taken uh, a, the multilateral system by surprise to a certain extent. Because I don't think that all the effects of globalization uh, were foreseen. Uh, because first of all, the main uh, a, uh, criticism of globalization fame came from the developing world. Uh, because the developing world, world felt marginalized by globalization. The people in the developing world felt that globalization meant that 
uh, the rich people uh, would get richer. But now we see that it is the people in the developed world who are actually uh, complaining of globalization. So the multilateral system has not perhaps been able uh, to reform itself, to uh, review its mechanisms, and to try to keep up with yeah. developments in the world. Is... And this is where we need actually yeah. to improve things. Okay. Because the, 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 the mechanisms that were put into place are not mechanisms that are good for all times. They are not mechanisms that sweet and are adapted to everything. They are mechanisms that need to be revised, need to be uh, uh, reviewed, that need to be improved. And therefore, I think perhaps this is one area in which uh, one needs to look into. Okay, so you've brought us to a very uh, crucial juncture, because I, I think we need to also develop, as, as you're suggesting, a greater self-awareness. And let me, let me make the point in, in this way. I, back in January, I was invited to a dinner with uh, experts in artificial intelligence. Almost all of them were engineers or had an engineering computer science background. And I was one of two or three who didn't. And I was sitting at the dinner table and for two hours I was completely lost. I was lost by the jargon, the terminology, the way they were thinking about these issues. And then toward the dessert, when I got to my, uh, my fine pastry, I began to understand it. And it really wasn't that hard for me to understand. But they had created this almost insuperable barrier through technical language. And I sometimes wonder, as we see in economics and development economics, or you see in, uh, in engineering or other professional disciplines, whether we ourselves, whether we're talking about uh, um, inter public international law, or whether we talk about international human rights law, or any subspecialty of law, we create a, a technical jargon uh, that for most people is incomprehensible. In, uh, in our human rights world, we talk about OPCAT and how countries have to set up NPMs or national preventive uh, uh, mechanisms and how they need to invite the SPT. To... We use acronyms, jargon. I think if I can be utterly uh, honest about this, I think it, a lot of it serves our own sense of vanity, that we present ourselves with, as people with expertise, as people who are knowledgeable, and for most people who are non-lawyers, non-practitioners, or unaffected by an immediate issue, it seems like an alien space. Uh, and uh, perhaps we need to do better and be reminded of the simplicity of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is written in a language everyone can understand. Um, when I compare it and contrast it with some of the decisions issued by either the ICJ and I had the privilege of uh, two, uh, attending two of the oral submissions uh, when I was a representative of a state, uh, or whatever comes out of the treaty body system. I mean, unless you're a lawyer, you're not going to understand it. And so there is a, we, we, uh, we uh, need, uh, of course, the legal community to defend our rights in, in national jurisdictions, before courts and dispute uh, mechanisms. But should we not also make everything we do more accessible to the person who's a non-lawyer so they understand in a very visceral sense the importance of what it is that we're doing? Is that, is that not a fair reflection, Hina? Yes, quite right. And I think a lot of our efforts have been um, focused in that direction over the years. That uh, law, uh, international law in particular, which is really principles uh, of, of human rights, they should be explained to people and present their problems uh, explained to them and the remedies explained to them in the context of what is fair and what is just and that's how we kind of connect with the social movements as well. But I think the important thing here is that if we want the international system to prevail, uh, we have to recognize that the whole concept of sovereignty also has to be unpackaged. Uh, 
states have claimed sovereignty in my field of work, for instance, when there is international scrutiny of their um, human rights record, and uh, they they suddenly come up with this uh, this rhetoric of um, sovereignty. Now, what what kind of irks me many times is that it's not the state that's sovereign. It's the people who are sovereign. And all our constitutions say that very clearly. When the rights of those very people in whose name the state claims sovereignty are in question, then I do believe that there must be an international norm developed to show states that here the uh, concept of sovereignty has in many ways to give way to the concept of protection of the people and respect for their human rights. Why is the international system important for people? And when will they feel that this is something that is important for them and connected with their everyday lives? They would feel it when we, they see the gap at the international level. When the national, sorry, they see the gap at the national level. When at the national level, the state is either unwilling or unable to provide the remedy that I was speaking of. This international and multilateral system provides the alternative, the critical imp uh, alternative to the people who have grievances at the national level and bring it at the, and are able to bring it at the international level. And that's the beauty of the, inter the international human rights system that we have developed. It needs to be fine-tuned. It needs to be uh, uh, defined, uh, you know, kind of uh, defined in a way in which that system is able through its uh, actions to uh, deal with inter uh, national level violations or international uh, principles are able to, through their uh, consequences or through their um, functioning, able to fairly apportion benefits of the system, the global system for everyone. You know, this globalization is a problem actually arose with the developing countries, mostly because people started feeling that if there are benefits, they're not fairly apportioned. Yes. And they go to a certain sector and in the international community, but not to the rest of us. So I think this fair apportionment of benefits must be uh, the, the, the endeavor and the effort that we must have and the objective we must have. Because universality and global uh, glo globalization, not just of, at the economic level, but otherwise, is uh, inevitable. And that, I think, has to be kept in mind. But it will only succeed and frustrations will only be prevented if we keep in mind also this principle of fair apportionment of benefits. Yes. No, I, I mean, you, you touch on so many important points. If I can go back to the previous intervention you made, though, about uh, how it is that we have member states or the governments accept decisions by international bodies, uh, judicial bodies, uh, such that the remedies are available, uh, when you have two things happening, seemingly, in, from my perspective. One is that we have a new crop, a new generation of leaders who feel no shame no shame in ignoring decisions by the multilateral system or by judicial bodies. Uh, two, we don't have the sort of coalitions of countries that will back a decision uh, taken by a judicial body. It just, it's now a, a sort of archipelago, as a friend described it once, an archipelago as opposed to a series of different leverage points over governments. And so we go back to the, the leadership point here about how we shed light and then convince an unconvinced leadership because the leadership in many of these countries is self-serving and nothing but. And uh, to the point on sovereignty, I have challenged a number of countries, as I'm sure you have, to come up with the legal reasoning behind that would back up their position as to why it is that we can't shed light on a particular uh, human rights violation in a particular context. And they have not met the challenge. They have not come to me to make the, to make the argument because, as we know, the General Assembly had to deal with frequent submissions from the uh, apartheid government in South Africa over many years 
that the General Assembly was meddling in its uh, internal affairs, that it was intervening in uh, essentially the domestic sphere. And uh, the uh, General Assembly resoundedly or resoundingly rejected those arguments. And, and so uh, it's a, a weak uh, legal stick to use in terms of defending the argument, but they, that's how they do it. Um, my sense, uh, the way we can tie this together is to connect what it is that we do with uh, the social movements in many countries uh, where you see a great sort of sense of energy, but it uh, remains uh, limited to partitions on specific issues in specific countries, and uh, that they can develop a sense of momentum and produce results is undeniable, but it's how to fuse this better with what it is that we do. And I'll just give you an example. I mean, when I look at the proceedings in the context of the UN mechanisms we have in place, whether it be you know, the participation uh, before an advisory opinion or in an advisory opinion before the ICJ, or when I used to serve on the UN Security Council or uh, indeed in, in now working in Geneva. And I look at, for instance, the number of viewers who are viewing the proceedings that we are involved with. Um, out of a population, a global population now approaching 8 billion in a few years, you have a few hundred views, a few thousand views at most. Maybe the total number of views the UN has ever collected on a specific issue, um, a, a specific speech, 10 million at most. The penetration, the penetration seems to be, seems to be rather superficial in the sense that not enough people are aware of the depth and the importance of what it is that we're doing. If somehow we can connect better to these movements, to better explain to them what it is uh, that is being protected uh, by the system uh, and to mobilize their efforts uh, in conjunction and augmented by our energies, uh, then uh, perhaps we have more leverage to ensure that decisions are abided by. And, uh, and that the framework is respected. Ultimately, the framework has to be respected. Is that, is that pie in the sky thinking or am I thinking along the right uh, track? Uh, Mr. President, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, I don't think you are putting me on the spot because I think that uh, we are all talking about the same thing, uh, but uh, we are coming to it from different directions. And uh, I agree with you when you refer to the need for more accessibility uh, to uh, what we do, to, uh, to also the decisions of uh, uh, human rights bodies and judicial institutions at the international level. And that we should use language which is more accessible to the wider public. Uh, we try our best always to do that uh, and, of course, to break down uh, after we issue a judgment, uh, to break down that judgment uh, for the wider public and to put it into a language which is uh, uh, a understandable and accessible to everyone. But, of course, you cannot abandon in the exercise of your profession itself a certain uh, a technical language because it is the language with which through which you communicate also with others in the same profession it is the common language that you use in that profession and uh, in that sense i think that when you talk about the for example the universal declaration of human rights the universal declaration of human rights was originally adopted as a declaration of the UN General Assembly. And you know that declarations of the UN General Assembly under the Charter are not binding instruments. And it is through the pronouncements of uh, uh, judicial bodies like the International Court of Justice that actually the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has acquired uh, the legal character it has today because the court has said and has referred to the provisions of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as 
uh, norms or principles or rules of customary international law. And so uh, it is through the clarification and interpretation of those instruments. Uh, however simple may be the language in which they are written, and a better understanding of those instruments is that we can also uh, bring about the use of the instruments for the protection of peoples, or for the protection of individuals, for the protection of collectivities, and for the protection of individual human beings. And this has been the uh, main concern and preoccupation of the court, for example, with respect to the cases that have been brought before the court on genocide. The Bosnia-Herzegovina cases, uh, the Croatian cases, both cases brought against the Serbia. And the court has actually tried its best to explain uh, to the outside world, because for example, and that is the danger which exists, is when words are used uh, loosely, because accessibility is one thing, but the loose uh, use or the vague uh, use of words can also have uh, negative consequences. Uh, the, the, the court tried its best to explain to a wider public what actually genocide means, that we should not uh, a for example, equate uh, ethnic cleansing, however bad it is, with the legal definition of genocide. And the court has recognized, for example, that there were instances of ethnic cleansing which were admitted by the states themselves, that uh, uh, a, the states which committed this uh, ethnic cleansing. And the court actually determined that there was genocide in the case of Shreb uh, Renitsa uh, in uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. So I think this is also a, a work of simplifying, a work of explaining, a work of making uh, the law and uh, not only uh, public international law, but human rights law also more accessible to a wider public. Uh, a second point which uh, you raised, uh, my commissioner, which is of interest to me also, personally, is the issue of the artificial intelligence which you referred to. And that's why I say that we need to uh, bring the system uh, into a state or a condition, the multilateral uh, system of cooperation, uh, which can keep up with, for example, technological development. Uh, of course, uh, people are looking towards the use of artificial intelligence uh, in order to uh, increase perhaps productivity, uh, to benefit human beings uh, in the production of goods and services, etc., and uh, in a, a in in making life in making life or rendering certain a, uh, aspects of life easier for human beings, but there are also the dangers uh, that are uh, a, no. uh, that can arise from the use of artificial intelligence and. There is a lot of discussion nowadays about uh, the creation of autonomous weapon yes. systems yes. Yes. and the danger yes. that they pose for humanity in general. Yes, no, uh, this is a point that we are very uh, keen to continue to monitor and observe. And uh, I was in Silicon Valley not long ago and there was a, a distinguished uh, leader within the tech industry who opined that artificial general intelligence uh, will more or less solve all our problems in 20 to 30 years. Uh, he drew a gasp when he mentioned this from the audience, and I was on stage with him, because clearly in countries where you don't have deep uh, digital penetration, uh, those uh, the remedies are not available. <laughs> so, so we do have a long way to go. My, my sense is that we need to reinforce each other. We need to reinforce civil society. We need to make our work more comprehensible. 
maybe not us, uh, but we need others to help us translate what it is that we're doing so that people understand when you have General Comment 34 on uh, freedom of opinion and expression and how it relates to uh, Article 20 of uh, ICCPR, that they understand the language of General Comment 34. It's not merely for a court to interpret it, but they understand what the what the treaty body is trying to opine and impart through it. And others perhaps need to help because if we can uh, better make people understand, they can then defend the system which we are saying is still quite fragile because it is in, in the process of being built. I, I would also add to our worries in the sense I would say that there is no state uh, in uh, the world today that isn't still work in progress. Every state is or can be ruined by a generation or two of reckless politicians, every state. And if we, we combine that to what it is that we're trying to discuss, I think the return of an emphasis on the rights of the individual, to power, empower that individual, to defend the system and for us to defend them, um, I think, and to convince uh, governments that that this is not divorced from their fundamental interest uh, of, uh, of securing the widest uh, share of benefits for the entire population, not to serve a community, but to serve the whole. I think if we can strike in that uh, direction, uh, we're on to a, a more positive trajectory. But it needs, at, at a fundamental level, leadership, not just of people like us, but uh, really individuals throughout countries, and we see them, and we see human rights defenders do the most amazing things. And both of you can count yourselves as human rights defenders in your past and former careers. And, uh, and I think that's, that's the greatest resilience that we can secure for ourselves in terms of protections for the system. Ultimately, if I can boil it all down, it, it requires courage. And, and that's what we need to see for, first and foremost on the part of people who maintain the system in, in, in place. Hina? Yes, I think um, what you, I totally agree with what you said, and I think we do need to preserve this system. Uh, this is the, the, the you know, uh, uh, the, more, the basic minimum that we all need in order for the global affairs to go forward and to proceed in a fair and just manner. I think we also need um, ethical leadership, a leadership that has that does not submit to populism, but is able to lead its people, allay the fears and insecurities that uh, make people target and, and attack uh, uh, international human rights un and, and universal values of uh, human rights, of democracy. And I do believe that these are some of the current um, issues that confront us, difficult to overcome, but it's not impossible. And I think many of us are already uh, making uh, overtures uh, in our different fields, especially you, High Commissioner, and I think you've done a brilliant job, at least in being able to put forward that this is these are principles that we stand for, that there are sufficient number of people who are, uh, you know, uh, putting their weight behind these, uh, these um, principles, and that they are not in any way isolated in their struggles. It, there may be people who are at the moment, because of the understanding or lack of understanding that they may have, who are trying to um, deviate or, or, or make these principles recede in some way, but that will not happen because they will stay. The only thing is, what do we find, what ways do we find to make this as painless as possible? Yes. No, I thank you for your comments. I, I, uh, you remind me of a French wit who, referring to populism, said of a particular leader, uh, and was quoting the leader, I think uh, sort of tongue-in-cheek, when uh, he said, well, of course I have to follow them. I'm their leader. <laughs> and so... So this is what ultimately we need to, to uh, have uh, reassessed. Uh, we need uh, ethical leadership, leadership based on, on principles, legal principles, on legal norms, uh, and to understand. I, I, I am worried, I have to convince, uh, convey uh, to you this growing tendency we see in the international media more particularly to discuss values and to discuss uh, ethics 
as a means of almost avoiding the discussion on rights and law and, uh, and treaty law, which is binding on states and those states that are, have exceeded. And I think this is something that we also need to be careful of, that, um, that the, the decisions have already been taken on some of these key uh, issues and we cannot go backwards. I am, I am of the belief, and uh, I think others share this, that if we tried from scratch to uh, rewrite or draft the Convention Against Torture, it certainly wouldn't be in the, in the form it is uh, that we see today. Or I can't imagine how they would draft Article 2 in the way that it is today. And so we sense the pressure on the dam or since the president is in The Hague on the dike and we have our fingers that are plugging the holes, uh, I hope uh, the three of us will continue to plug the holes where they emerge. And I thank you for taking part in this discussion. Uh, I hope I've acquitted myself well as, <laughs> as an interviewer and moderator. And I look forward to, to continuing this uh, uh, beyond camera. And to all of you who have joined us, thank you uh, for taking the time. Uh, and I would like on your behalf to thank uh, President Yusuf of the International Court of Justice and Hina Jelani, a champion uh, for the human rights uh, agenda and a champion of all human rights uh, advocates and, and ad activists. Thank, uh, thank you both and thank you for taking the time to be with us. Thank you.